Good morning and welcome to those here and online. Glad to have you here this morning as well as online. Uh, we are gathered together here on this first Sunday of June, and today begins the celebration of pride. Uh, in the United States, June is the month designated for pride. Esty and I had the opportunity to go down to the pride parade yesterday, and uh, there was a lot of people out in downtown Cleveland as part of the parade and some of the displays. And one of the things that we were talking about uh, when we got home is we just love the diversity of people that you see at the Pride gathering. And so uh, one of the things that often happens in church is everybody kind of looks the same, sounds the same, uses the same language. It really is a subculture to itself. But I am reminded that God loves diversity. God created diversity. And today is also called Pentecost Sunday, which celebrates the giving of the Holy Spirit. And when you think about that uh, uh, event of the giving of the Holy Spirit, uh, there were a variety of people gathered in Jerusalem on that day that spoke a variety of different languages. And the Lord enabled those who were the apostles and others to be able to speak in tongues. You can read about this in Acts chapter 2 as a way of saying to all those that have been gathered that indeed they are loved and they are accepted. And that's what we want to say this morning as well to all those that are part of the LGBTQ community. You are loved, you are accepted. And uh, one of the things that uh, we want to remind you that as we gather here today, we welcome all races, all religions, all countries of origin, all sexual orientations, all genders, all abilities and disabilities. We stand with you. We are offering you a safe place under the shade tree, and we are going to continue to explore our faith together. And so today we're going to start a new series and this sermon series I am calling Counterweight, and I'll introduce that in a moment as to why I titled it as such. But as we gather together this morning, um, we're going to watch a couple of videos. Uh, I had a, a last-minute um, rearrangement. As most of you know, uh, the Fetzers have been in Scotland for the past month, and uh, they came home this past week, and... Uh, Corey called me this morning, and he has tested positive for COVID, so we wish him that him, he'll get well quickly. And uh, Jenny, who has been leading us in worship, had a previous commitment for this Sunday, so you're stuck with me and some videos that I put together for today. So one quick reminder that you might want to dial into uh, much of what we're talking about on Pentecost Sunday is how the Holy Spirit brings a variety of different types of pe people, cultures, and languages together. And one of the things that we just started this past Wednesday night is a supplementar supplemental study uh, that I have entitled Intersection. And we're looking at the collision of identity and culture and the desire for one group try to control other groups. And so if you're interested in that, we upload that onto our YouTube channel as well. So today, what I'd like to do is begin with a call to worship that actually we did two weeks ago. I did a little bit of modification on it, and here's why. Over the last three weeks, each week there has been a major gun uh, violence event, a major shooting. And uh, it seems as though we just can't get a handle on this. So we look to God to ask God to help us uh, to know what to do, to have the wisdom to do it and have the willpower to do it. So if you would stand with me for a moment, I'd like to read this as a part of our lament for where we currently are in the history of our country and we're asking God to intervene. God of weary hearts, death has gutted us and left us reeling once again. Mass violence has once again come upon our land, and it shouldn't be this way. It doesn't have to be this way, but it is. Our words fail us, our tears drench us, our rage consumes us, our weariness overwhelms us. 
May our sorrow become fuel for our compassion, our cynicism for honest reflection, our rage a drive for holy action, that tools of violence may give way to pathways of peace. O oh God, may your fierce love and tenderness steady the feeble knees and shattered hearts of those whose lives have forever been changed. Set your people free to pursue the paths of peace. Amen. So what we're going to do is uh, have an opportunity, once I pray, for you to listen to a song. This is a song I ran across this past week that uh, I think kind of echoes what's in our heart. But before we get to that, let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we come into your presence this morning and we ask you to meet us here. We ask for your intervention in our country, especially during this turbulent times of loss of innocent life. We ask, Father, we might not worship the idol of uh, gun ownership and gun use to such an extent that we disregard the loss of life around us. Help us, Lord God, to lay down our swords and to pick up the pathway of peace and walk together in unity. We gather together today to understand a little bit more of how we get out of balance. And we pray, Father, as we open up this new series, that we might be able to have a counterbalance with counterweights that enable us to stay balanced in our walk with you and with others. So put your blessing on our time here today. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You can have a seat, please. This particular song is We'll All Be Free. And it was recorded, obviously, during the COVID time where different people played different parts through computer brought together. This is done by William Matthews and some other individuals. And uh, it's part of a law, excuse me, a longing uh, that our world will be a better place. Let's watch it. This first is a quote from Roman Williams. Um, I want to read this and then we'll watch. The fragile human world will one day be caught up into the endless glory of God and will be held securely in God's hands forever. But this is not a moment that has arrived in all its fullness in our history. We know about the promise because of the reality of Jesus' resurrection. What this means is not an instant triumphant conclusion to history, but a fresh commitment to work in light of the promise we have glimpsed, confident that what we do has meaning because it is at one with the purposes of God. Let's watch.
Now this one you might know, so will you stand and uh, we're going to follow a video and this is a song that we have done for a number of years, Good, Good Father. Let's sing along.
I want to begin a series this morning that's going to talk about faith. So over the next four weeks, I want to talk a little bit about the nature of faith. And when you talk about faith, you're talking about something that is very slippery. It's hard to get a hold of. Sometimes the idea of faith is projected from a religious point of view as having certainty or assurance um, that it's trust alone in God and the ability to be confident that God is always going to come through. When we study the subject of faith in the scripture, it has a lot of different angles to it. Now, we live by faith all the time. You got in your car to come to church today. And when you got into your car, you trusted that your car was going to start, that your brakes were going to work, and that when you got here, uh, your car would have brought you here safely. That's an act of faith, because all of us had, have had times where we've gotten into the car and it didn't start, or there's something that broke down along the way. But when you get into the car and you attempt to start it, you have this confidence that it's going to take you where you want to go. Every time you go to a restaurant, you eat by faith. You really do. Uh, the food that you are eating, you're trusting that it's safe, number one, and that the server didn't spit it, number two, uh, that all of this is safe for you to enjoy. There is a serious side to faith, too. So you take your paycheck to a bank, and you deposit it, and you have faith that they're going to hold your money until you need it, and you can withdraw it. So we all operate by faith all the time, don't we? However, this divine angle is extremely important because it has some important questions that are attached to it. What is the purpose of life? Is there a divine being who created the world uh, that initiated my existence in the world? Who am I? Why am I here? What am I supposed to do with my life? What is God like? Is God safe? Is God knowable? There's all kinds of questions. And all of these things are elements of faith, certainly. And because you have faith in a trustworthy, loving God, you begin to build a certain life on top of that. It determines your values. It gives you hope. Uh, even when life is wildly out of control, like we have seen over the last three weeks, still you look to it and you determine that you're going to trust that you're going to be safe the next time you go to the grocery store. Your kids are going to be safe the next time you send them to school and so forth. Now, the Bible speaks of faith in a variety of different ways. And what I want to do is show you that it doesn't speak with just one voice. So here's a quick overview of that. When you explore the nature of faith, it's hard to get a handle on when you look at separate Bible passages. For example, is this faith's best definition? Hebrews 11.1. 1. Now, faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. So that's right there in the book of Hebrews, chapter 11. Um, but the, is that really a good definition of faith, or is that more a descriptor of faith, that you have certain assurances and you have certain convictions of things that are not seen, but is that how faith operates? You turn to another passage of Scripture, and you see that you have a certain amount of trust because your faith is connected to something. So Ephesians 2.8 says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not of your own doing, it is the gift of God. So the object of your faith in this case is the grace of God given freely through the love of God. How about faith is a creed? So sometimes we'll recite the Apostles' Creed together. This is one that is found in the New Testament, 1 Timothy 3.16. Without any doubt, the mystery of our religion is great. He was revealed in the flesh, vindicated in spirit, seen by angels, proclaimed among Gentiles, 
believed in throughout the world, taken up in glory. So there's certain things that Paul, the writer of 1 Timothy, believes about Jesus and sets this forth as a creed for other people to believe in. Or how about faith and how it conducts your life? So faith also has a certain behavior related to it. James chapter 2, verses 14 and 17 says, What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if you say you have faith but do not have works? Can faith save you? So by faith itself, if it has no works, is dead. So James says, okay, it's one thing to say you have faith, but it's more than an intellectual exercise. It has something to do with the way you live your life. Now, the way you approach faith is a life-altering uh, influence upon your life. Faith in God has all of this kind of attached to um, the way we live our life with confidence, with freedom, and with joy as well. So what I want us to think about here for a moment is usually the way people think about faith in church is they connect two things, certainty and simplicity. In other words, I, I just believe. I just believe. And I have to be certain that what I believe is right or true. Now, how many of you have ever seen, this goes way back, there's a game that was called Tippet. Do you re anybody remember that game at all? Okay, so there's a picture of it here. So it's a guy that is on the top of the pole, and you have a certain color of disc, and there's three points on it. And you spin uh, this spinner, and if it comes up your color, then you've got to take a disc off of one of the sides, okay? And you're trying to take that disc off one of the sides without the uh, thing becoming uh, so heavy on the other side that it tips and sends this guy on the top of it flying, okay? So I had this game when I was a kid. And the trick of it is trying to figure out, so that you're not the individual that sends this guy flying, how to pick off your colored disc from which, um, which point. In other words, if you're the blue disc and you need to take a blue disc off, which of the three points that keeps this guy balanced can you take off without it falling off, okay? Well... When you think about faith only in religious terms, where it's about simplicity, I'm just trusting God, and certainty that what I'm believing in is right. You're placing all the discs on two sides, and it's not counterbalanced, so that you can find uh, a, a way to keep your faith standing upright. So what I'm trying to say is this. A lot of times religion will simply say, just trust, just believe, and the rational side of people that likes to think and likes to have evidence and likes to explore and that type of thing says, but you don't know, in every other area of my life, I look at things logically, I look at things linearly, I look at things in ways that help me reach a conclusion. What you're telling me is I can't do that with faith. And my point is that many times what has happened is those that have been brought to faith through a church or a ministry of some sort have been left to... Uh, get this thing off balance to the point where some people have fallen off the tip, and that's called deconstruction, or people who have lost their faith because the scales tip in such a direction that it leaves them confused, it leaves them interconflicted, uh, it might even cause a crisis of faith. So what I want to do over the next four weeks is to show you to keep faith balanced you need to understand these four things, and we're going to take one of them each week. Faith also evolves, faith also adapts, faith also doubts, and faith also explores. So if you can kind of hold all of those things in tension, what we're going to do for the next few moments is talk a little bit 
about the fact that faith evolves. So listen to Brian McLaren in his book, it's a bit dated, called Finding Faith. He says this, the search for faith also involves non-cognitive parts of us, emotions, longings, aspirations, dreams, and hopes, and fears, drives, desires, and intuitions. It often forces us to face some ugliness in ourselves, some hard facts about life, requiring courage, honesty, and determination. Faith involves admitting with humility and boldness that we need to change, to go against the flow, to be different, to face and shine the light on our cherished delusions and prejudices, and to discover new truths that can be liberating, even though they may be difficult for the ego and painful to the pride. The search for an authentic faith must be the most life-changing quest anyone can ever launch. That's called Finding Faith on page uh, 13 and 14. So if that is true, then one of the things that we need to do is, first of all, understand that faith is always evolving. It's not static. Sometimes when people uh, trust in God or trust in Christ, they think that their faith just stays the same the rest of their life. And that will get people in trouble every time. We are simply going to understand that even in the Bible itself, we see an evolution of faith from the beginning all the way to the end. Now, many times we need a faith that is better than the one that has been handed to us. And because that is true, we need to have faith evolve as it emerges from one state of being that we're in to another. And we can call this evolving faith. We can call it reconstruction or readapting, whatever you might call it. But that often causes people to be fearful. So sometimes people want certainty in their life. And so to have certainty, nothing can change. Have you ever know, known people like that? And it can be in the simplest of things. They're fearful of change, and they want to keep things the way it always has been. Now, when that comes to faith, many times what that does is it causes people to kind of shut down in evolving in their faith, growing in their faith, learning more. So there's all kinds of lingo that is used. I just want that old time religion. Well, that's kind of a subtle way of saying, don't force me to think. Don't force me to change. I just want to believe what I once did when I was nine years old, when I was baptized, and I don't want to wrestle with the fact that life is more complex than that. So many times people don't like to think about this stuff. Sometimes people are spiritually lazy, you might say. But you evolve in other areas of your life all the time. When you became a parent, if you're a parent, um, you changed. You had to change. If you did not change, you wouldn't change your baby. You wouldn't feed your baby. You have to change if you're going to be a good parent or if you're going to be a good employee. Maybe there's a new software that was introduced. And if you're going to stay working in the place that you are working, you're going to have to change. You're going to have to learn that new software just to be able to continue to do your job. Are you following what I'm saying? And so we are adapt to changing in every other area of life, right? So we'll make changes. Let's say science introduces new medication. Uh, so Annie's a nurse, and uh, this medication has the way to make uh, inroads into certain diseases. And you'd be stupid if you ignored what has been discovered because it could be life-saving, let's say. So we do this in areas of other areas of life all the time. Now, here's the issue. Everyone's faith evolves, or at least it should from the time they first come to faith. And faith doesn't stand still. It never has stood still. 
but many times people do not observe that. The evolution of faith is as old as the Bible. And if you want me to give you a proof text, I will give you a couple of references in a, mo a moment. But all you have to do is read the Bible itself and you see it changing from the beginning to the end. So here's what I want you to think about uh, before I give you those references. So Brian McLaren, in another book that he has written, um, talks about four stages of faith that we all go through. Simplicity, complexity, perplexity, and then finally harmony. And what he says is we all go through this. We go through the process of changing from one level of faith to another. And what we find is life forces us to move. So you had simplicity in other areas of your life, and then other things came along, and it's more complex, and perhaps you were perplexed about how to make the changes to adapt, but finally you do. And when, <clears throat> when you do, you can find harmony within that area of your life. Now, when it pertains to religious faith, you have to keep this in mind. While there is a description of where a person might be in their faith, there are also dangers that come along with it. So let's say the simplistic faith looks like this. It says, everything is knowable. Hey, I have God's word. God's word is all I need. It's the truth. So don't confuse me with science. Don't confuse me with other uh, discoveries that type of thing, and everything seems to be lumped into good versus bad, or us versus them. So have you noticed a lot of times in Christianity, Christianity doesn't know what to do with other world religions. And so it's us versus them. We're right, they're wrong. Rather than learning from other world religions, possibly insights that can be quite helpful to our lives, Rather, we want to know that everything that I believe is right, possibly everything that they believe is not right. Well, notice what you have just done. With simplistic faith, you become arrogant, you become combative, and you become judgmental on other people. So, if you see somebody with a turban on their head, one, one of the things in a simplistic faith is you're going to say, that person is not trustworthy. And if you're really extreme, you'll say, all people that wear turbans are people that are terrorists. And you go, come on, really? Are you seriously thinking that way? But that simplistic way of looking at faith. So people move a little bit. And their faith gets a little bit more complex. And they realize, especially in the Bible, that there's more than one viewpoint on things. So the minute you open the Bible... The very first chapter of the Bible, Genesis chapter 1, gives us a creation account in Genesis chapter 1. And you can take that literally, and you'll say, this is the way it is, until you get to chapter 2. You're not but two chapters into the Bible, and there's a change. Because in Genesis chapter 2, there's a second creation account that doesn't agree with the first creation account. Okay? They're different. Why? Well, because the book of Genesis is a compilation that's been put together by different editors, and they let the tension stand there. So what you'll say is there's more than one viewpoint on creation in Genesis chapter 1 and 2. And then you begin to say, okay, because in life there's more than one viewpoint on things, then what's effective versus what is ineffective. All of a sudden we become pragmatic. Let me choose the more pragmatic, effective thing. And what can happen is idealism, that is, this is what works. This, what isn't, this doesn't work, and so forth. So the ideal is find what works and hold on to that. But there's some dangers with that. Sometimes you can say, there's more than one viewpoint, I have my viewpoint, and that's it. And you can be kind of superficial in the process because you don't want to wrestle with things. 
Secondly, you can always become overly pragmatic. I'm only going to do what works. Well, there's a lot of truth in things that are not necessarily as pragmatic as what you want. Thirdly, sometimes it's quite naive to have this idealism that doesn't have any feet on the road. Okay, third stage is perplexity. And that is a bit agnostic in nature in the sense of, uh, what is truth? Remember Pilate said that when Jesus was on trial? What is truth? Who knows what is truth? Everyone has their own opinion. And all I can do is be honest with what I believe. Now, in a day and age where there is such, um, we are inundated with news sources. You know, you watch one news source and then a different news source and you go, well, what is the truth, right? They present it this way, they present it that way. So the danger here is you can become quite cynical. I can't trust anyone, all right? You can also become uncommitted. And that is, since you can't trust anyone, because there's a variety of different viewpoints on everything, then I'm just going to stay distant from all of this type of thing. But while at a distance, I'll be overly critical <laughs> of people that are trying to engage and wrestle with things. Last stage is harmony. Now, harmony is this idea that the scriptures can be summarized as Jesus did this with these two words. Love God, love neighbor. Love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. Which means in a wide variety of different types of Christians and different types of religions all around the world, we can have unity in these essentials. The dignity of human beings. Loving God and loving them. And so what we do is begin to focus on the important things that unite us and not the things that divide us. And boy, I think that's a, really what we need to look at at our, at our uh, stage in, in the history of our country. So we then make decisions based upon that. We understand that life is a gift and love is the point, and I make a choice to do what is beneficial. So these slides here, the left side was what was found in Brian McLaren's book, Faith After Doubt, The Four Stages of Faith. What's on the right side is what I added to it, to counterbalance it, the counterweight that enables us to stay balanced in understanding this. So here's what I want to do with the time we have remaining. One of the things that we see in Scripture is there is an evolving of faith. And I'm just going to use two examples for us this morning. So when you read the Scriptures, what you're going to see in the first example is the story of Job. Are you familiar with the story of Job at all? It takes up 42 chapters in the Old Testament. Actually, out of those 42 chapters, uh, about 38 of them is poetry. So you have narrative, chapters 1 and 2, and the last couple of chapters is narrative as well. In between is poetry. Now, what we find in the book of Job is this. Here is a man that has everything going for himself. He's got a good family. He's an upright, righteous man. He is an individual that uh, intercedes in prayer on behalf of his family so that they don't make wrong decisions. But behind the scenes, there is this cosmic bet that goes on between God and this being called the Hasatan. We call him Satan or the devil or what. And Satan says to God, the only reason Job loves you and the only reason that he worships you is because uh, he is like a paid lover. He has everything going right for him. So why wouldn't he trust you? Why wouldn't he believe in you? If you take away all of these blessings from his life, he will. He will curse you. So God says you can't take his life, but there's kind of a test that is put on Job's life. And so he loses his health. He loses his wealth. He loses his family. He loses his livestock. I mean, one thing after another. 
And he has these friends that come along, and these friends are operating on a basis of faith that is early on in the Old Testament. And it's kind of a retributive idea. Job, the only reason you're suffering all of these things that you're going through is because you have sinned against God. Right? You have sinned. And there is this direct relationship. That is, if you're suffering, you have sinned. Because this God is a tit-for-tat being who always operates on the basis of reward and punishment. How many of you know people like that in their faith? Everything is reward or punishment. What did I do to deserve this? Uh, that type of thing. So, the bulk of the book of Job is this... Um, poetry of Job trying to wrestle with the fact that he didn't do anything wrong. And that's what he tells his friends. He tells his friends, I didn't do anything wrong to deserve all this that I'm going through. So by the time you get to the end of the book, what you find is in chapter 42, verse 7, God speaks to kind of the front person of this group of friends that Job has. I just want to read it for you. Job chapter 42, verse 7. After the Lord had spoken these words to Job, the Lord said to Eliphaz the uh, Temite, My wrath is kindled against you and against your two friends, for you have not spoken of me what is right, as my servant Job has. Isn't that fascinating? Job had it right. He didn't deserve any of this stuff. You see, Job, his faith had evolved in trusting that God is a good God, even though he can't understand why he's going through what he's going through. So the friends have this old viewpoint of God, but Job has this evolved faith in God that God is truly up to something that he cannot understand but he's still going to trust. And this famous verse is found in the book of Job. Though he slay me, yet will I trust him. In other words, even if God takes my life, yet I'm going to trust him. So here's the point. Job's friends have a retributive view of God. You're suffering this because of that. Job doesn't have that understanding of God at all. He knows that he has done nothing wrong to deserve his suffering. So in the end, what we find is God comes and agrees with Job that the friends have a misrepresentation of God. Well, the friends could build a case out of the book of Deuteronomy that God says, hey, if you obey me, I will bless you. If you disobey me, I will punish you. But Job himself is saying, no, that's not always the case. You've got to be able to move beyond this and understand that God does things that are mysterious. So that's example number one. One other one. Example number two. So there's these two books that are found in the Old Testament. One is the book of Nahum, and the other is the book of Jonah. You're probably familiar with Jonah because Jonah tells the story of a runaway prophet uh, that gets swallowed by a fish, then gets regurgitated upon the shore, and finally goes to proclaim to the nation of Assyria, and in particular the capital city is Nineveh, to repent uh, and to come to God. So Jonah is familiar, but Nahum is not. So Assyria, this ancient empire, was a brutal empire. And they conquered people around them all the time. And in conquering people, they often tortured people. Some of them were skinned alive. And so the book of Nahum is this short little three-chapter book that is the oracle of this prophet named Nahum saying God hates the Ninevites. He absolutely hates the Ninevites. Let me give you an example. Nahum chapter 1. It says, a jealous and avenging God is the Lord. The Lord is avenging and wrathful. The Lord takes vengeance on his adversaries and rages against his enemies. So it goes on and it says this. In chapter 2, he talks about how God is against these people. 
Uh, it says in verse 13 of chapter 2, See, I'm against you, says the Lord of hosts, and I will burn your chariots in smoke, and the sword shall devour your young lions. I will cut off your prey from the earth, and the voice of your messengers shall be heard no more. I'm going to wipe you out, and I'm going to embarrass you in the process. In chapter 3, verse 5, it says, I'm against you, says the Lord of hosts. I will lift up your skirts over your face, and I will let the nations look on your nakedness and your kingdoms on your shame. Pretty aggressive, isn't it? So Nahum has this very aggressive viewpoint of God, that God hates the Ninevites, he's going to judge the Ninevites, he's going to wipe the Ninevites off the face of the earth. And then comes Jonah. So Jonah comes along, and two books prior to the book of Nahum is the book of Jonah. Now, Jonah is written later, after the book of Nahum, in the sequence of things, and more than likely, the book of Jonah is primarily a parable. And this parable is kind of written after the exile to describe a different viewpoint of God. So, Jonah receives this calling... To go to the Ninevites, chapter 1, verse 2, go at once to Nineveh, the great city, and cry out against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. Jonah, I have you on a mission to go to Nineveh and proclaim your wickedness is going to bring judgment. Repent. And what does Jonah do? If you know the story of Jonah, he turns the other way, he runs the other way, he gets aboard a boat that's going in the different direction, and, and by the time that uh, chapter 2 is done, he's thrown overboard because he's causing chaos and bringing judgment of God upon people, and it's there, the story of the fish. And then finally in chapter 3, after he's been regurgitated or resurrected, you might say, it says in verse 1, the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time saying, get up, go to Nineveh, that great city, and proclaim to it the message that I tell you. So Jonah sent out and went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly large city, a three days walk across. And Jonah began to go into the city going a day's walk and he cried out 40 days more and Nineveh will be overthrown. All right. So, what happens is the king hears the message of Jonah, and you know what he does? He has a change of heart. He repents. And as he repents, he covers himself with uh, uh, ashes and sackcloth, and, and he's showing that he has done wrong in leading this aggressive, violent empire. So, in chapter 4, Jonah gets mad. Here the city begins to repent. There's this big revival that's going on, and Jonah gets mad. And what's the reason? Let me read chapter 4, verse 1. But this was very displeasing to Jonah, and he became angry. He prayed to the Lord and said, O oh Lord, is this not what I said while I was still in my own country? That is why I fled to uh, Tarshish at the beginning, for I knew that you are a gracious God, a merciful, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love, and ready to relent from punishing. He's got a whole different viewpoint of God than Nahum. Two books separate uh, 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 from each other. One portrays God as this vengeful, punishing God. And Jonah gets mad about the fact that God loves the Ninevites. So in Nahum, God hates the Ninevites. And Nahum is celebrating their coming demise. But in Jonah, the prophet hates the Ninevites. I mean, uh, in Jonah, the prophet hates the Ninevites, but God does not. Isn't that something? God loves the Ninevites. And so Jonah, written later after the Babylonian captivity is this parable that is challenging the readers to also have a change of heart toward these Ninevites. Well, why would they have that change of heart? When they went into exile, you know what happened? They began to get on with their life, and they began to intermarry with some of the people that took them captive. They began to have family. 
They began to, uh, you know, be part of the community, that type of thing. And all of a sudden, they began to understand that the average Ninevite, the average Babylonian, the average Assyrian, the average Egyptian, these individuals that had families were just like them. They wanted a safe place for their family. They wanted food on the table. They wanted a good community in which they could live their lives. And all of a sudden, this parable of Jonah is reflecting this change of heart that came about after they lived among them. And they began to see that God is much bigger than what they once believed. And so Nahum has this rigid viewpoint of God. Jonah has this developing, evolving viewpoint of God. Two very simple examples, but it shows that the Bible doesn't present God in one way. Rather, Nahum, the older book, reflects a way of thinking that now has evolved, and as it has revolved, Jonah represents a more redemptive view of God. The Bible is a portrait of how people thought about God, and that evolved over a course of time. So let me say this as I close. Evolving faith is faith. It's a part of who we are. It's a part of what goes on inside of us. It's a part of what it means to be human. From moving uh, of what was once simple to what is complex. From what is perplexing to being okay with the fact that I can uh, live with mystery. That I can't figure everything out. You know something, God is always out ahead of his creation. So I mentioned earlier that today is Pentecost Sunday, the giving of the Spirit. And the Spirit, as we'll notice next week when I talk about faith is always adapting, the Spirit is always moving in new directions. That's what Jesus tells a man by the name of Nicodemus. So I want to encourage you to understand it is our sacred responsibility to embrace questions, not ignore them. To embrace change, not resist it. To understand that we evolve always in other areas of our life. And it's no different in our faith either. The Spirit of God is not beholden to a system that you find comfortable with. That's the story of denominationalism. That's the story of churches that have taken a system and said, this is what we believe, this is what we've always believed, this is what we will continue to believe, and we're never going to change. God is saying, will you, come on, I'm out ahead of you, will you catch up? I'm out here doing this new thing, will you let go of your system, which is full of holes anyways, and come and follow me? Well, where do we follow God? Well, where we follow him is to this place that is called the Lord's Table. And that's how we're going to finish our service this morning. Let me close with a quote from Richard Rohr. He says, The spiritual journey could be seen as a constant purification of motive until I can finally say I have no other reason to do anything except love of God and love of neighbor. And I don't even need people to know this. When I can say this, I have total and full freedom. I can no longer be bought off. Finally, I realize that my life is not about me. It is about love. This comes from a lecture he gave uh, called Adapted, Adapted from Francis of Assisi. Adapted from Francis, Subverting the Honor-Shame System. So what I'd like for us to do is to look at this picture that, um, we're going to skip that, and I want us to look at this picture. So as we come to the Lord's table, I want you to notice who did Jesus gather around the table with him? When you look at the disciples, you're going to see some fishermen up there. You're going to see a tax collector up there. You're going to see Simon the Zealot kind of a terrorist that wanted to force Rome out of the country. You have Judas, who was all consumed about money and betrayed Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. You want to talk about a hodgepodge of people. 
<laughs> that were gathered at this table with Jesus. They were not all the same. They were not uniform at all. And I wonder how much tension went on between these men that followed Jesus because they came from different backgrounds, because they looked at life differently. And you know something? Jesus brought all of them together and helped their faith evolve so that on the day of Pentecost, you know what happened? As they received the Holy Spirit, they went into all the world. They went in different directions, proclaiming this message for everyone to hear. And that is, we are all honored guests at love's table, every last one of us. And so he takes a piece of bread and he says, this is my body given for you. He takes the cup and he says, this is my blood. Drink it in remembrance of me. So each month we take the Lord's table and I'm going to invite you to go ahead and come on up. Watch the wires as you do so. Take a piece of bread and take a cup. And then when you're seated, we'll eat and drink together. Okay?